Before the release of Martin Scorsese's period revenge film Gangs of New York in 2002, it's safe to say expectations were high. It was a film that was highly anticipated and in the works since the 1970s. There was a general thought that the movie would go down as one of the great films, given the pedigree of those involved. Much was made about the subject matter, the lengthy production time, the film going over budget, the release date being repeatedly delayed and behind the scenes issues plaguing the shoot. But like James Cameron's Titanic, a picture Gangs of New York was often compared to, audiences thought it would come good in the end as the quality of the film, the huge number of awards it would garner and its growth would justify and absolve all previous problems. While reaction to the final film was mixed, the film grossed a respectable $193 million worldwide despite not breaking even in the US, and though it didn't win any, the film does boast 10 Oscar nominations to its name. In regards to the film itself, though it was praised for its excellent recreation of the dirty 19th century New York underbelly, its staggering ambition, scale and unflinching gritty violence, audiences and critics were in general agreement that the film lacked focus, was messy and had questionable artistic choices and, incredibly for a film that was in production for as long as it was, felt rushed. I personally enjoyed the film very much but I'm not blind to its obvious flaws. Unfortunately, the film is not the grand, sprawling saga that comfortably takes its place in cinematic history, but rather is a good movie where you can clearly see the ingredients were all there for it to be a great one. Much of the issues surrounding the film lie in its troubled production, and though numerous movies have had far worse births, often the problems after a while become public and common knowledge. Gangs of New York is interesting in that a lot of the issues, whilst not horrendously scandalous, appear to be hushed up or professionally done behind closed doors away from the vulture-like circling of the media, as it probably should be. Some of Hollywood's top publicists were hired during the shoot to downplay any rumours of problems during production. Two elements always remained constant in the whispers of troubles on the set of gangs in Rome. Director Martin Scorsese and producer Harvey Weinstein. It was the Italian-American's first project with the now-disgraced Weinstein, once one of the most powerful men in Hollywood and at the height of his power during the filming of Gangs. Weinstein's company, Miramax, jumped at the chance to work with Scorsese, but the two industry titans just didn't seem to see eye to eye on anything. For starters, Scorsese wanted to put his vision on celluloid, whilst Weinstein wanted to put bums in seats the quintessential director versus movie studio battle over the ages. This was the main catalyst for the constant disagreements that the two have admitted did take place. It is also worth pointing out that the two envisioned different kinds of films, with the director wanting to explore the riots and gang culture of the time, whilst Weinstein wanted to focus on the love triangle between the three leads. Scorsese is quoted as finding Weinstein imposing, with the producer denying the filmmaker a number of requests so regularly that he felt as though he was doing it on purpose, such as the building of a full-scale church or the means to film a cockfight for a scene, which Scorsese went and did anyway. Daniel Day-Lewis recalled one complaint from Weinstein that his character Bill the Butcher had too much oil in his hair. Whilst it is easy to side with one of the all-time great American filmmakers against a producer so famously intrusive that he got the nickname Harvey Scissorhands for editing and cutting films to suit whatever he wants, you do have to remember how expensive the film was and that it did end up going over schedule and over budget. It is only natural for Weinstein to insist on decisions such as the casting of Cameron Diaz for box office reasons in order to ensure the film ended up as a financial success. Swinging the empathy back in Scorsese's corner, however, is the knowledge that he returned most of his salary to preserve the film's budget, along with main star Leonardo DiCaprio. Whilst the tug of war went on between Scorsese and Weinstein, Miramax really started to exercise their control after the film began to spiral over its original $84 million budget, eventually hitting $100 million. Writer Jay Cox recalls the last week of shooting where he says, The pressure on Marty was intense. He was shooting the final confrontation between Daniel and Leo and they actually made him stop before he got all the shots. Scorsese eventually had to perform extended shoots after the film was put together to fill in the missing pieces. This is just one example that shows us how frustrating the shoot must have been for everyone involved. The final film is rumoured to be a far cry from the film Scorsese originally wanted. For one, he seems to break his own rules by placing modern day music in a period setting as opposed to using the score that Elmer Bernstein originally composed for the film. In addition to all the creative decisions he couldn't make due to the heavy hand of Harvey Weinstein. 
However, Scorsese has always maintained that the final film is his film and that he is happy with it. Whether this is Scorsese's distaste for alternate and director's cuts once again manifesting, as it has done in the past, him protecting himself by not going against powerful studios, or is just the honest truth is up to you. But what is interesting is that an alternate cut of Gangs of New York does exist, a three and a half hour version with the original Bernstein score that was more expansive than the final film. And it was the version that Scorsese happily presented to Weinstein as the final film which Weinstein and co cut down to 2 hours and 36 minutes. There is no conclusive proof that Scorsese was locked out of the editing room as has been suggested but I do find it interesting that there is a longer version of the film that the director at one point was content with. Writer Jeff Wells saw a work print version of the film that was longer than the theatrical cut and he noted it as having no voiceover narration and being more cinematic and favoured it over the final version, which he claimed is compressed, simplified, lathered in big movie music and, to some extent, thematically obscured. The description of a film tampered with the itchy fingers of Harvey Weinstein if you ask me. Director and producer David Powelland also saw this version of the film, saying it was the movie that Scorsese wanted to make for all these years. If you want Weinstein's comment on the longer cut, he claims Scorsese said, You think I'm that stupid that I'm gonna put out the director's cut at 3 hours and 36 minutes? That would prove Harvey's a genius. Whatever that means. All in all, though Gangs of New York was an enjoyable film, I feel an unscratched itch knowing that a longer cut exists that we'll never see which is apparently a superior film. This is complete speculation but I do feel also that Gangs of New York took something out of Scorsese. He directed it in a style which he refers to as kamikaze, basically meaning he went all out and put all his sweat and blood into it. The only other film I've heard him describe like this was Raging Bull, before which he was literally on his deathbed and went into the film thinking it would be his last. After Gangs, Scorsese's films began to feel more commercial and less personal. He was no longer pushing boundaries and had even started to make genre films like Shutter Island. Perhaps it's a case of a veteran filmmaker burnt out by a bogey project, or maybe it's simply a case of a YouTuber seeing too much in something that isn't there. I'll leave that for you to decide. Thanks for watching.